All right, Grand Rising, everyone. It's uh, Shalonda or Shay Seeking. And we are back in the short history of the Hebrews. And again, I don't know. I think today I'm just sitting here. Mm, I kind of just like was laying around today, kind of just like had a lot on my mind, you know, about, you know, things that are going on, you know, on this plane in these days. And again, whenever I go there, I'm always going also um, <clears throat> into things that remind me of what's going on in the biblical text or what has gone on in the past. Again, we're not living in the past. We're just revisiting it to see where we are in these days. Um, and I think that is very telling, like um, some of the things that are being read right now, because it seems like we're in a, like a parallel universe right now and these things are going on. So Again, I guess the way I do things is just like we're reading the text, right? But I'm going through and we're talking about, you know, current things. So it's just like sometimes, you know, I don't know, like, uh, you know, where to go with things. It's just, it's just like so much going on. It's so much going on and it's just like uh, it seems like there's no rhyme or reason or no direction um, but again, I like the fact that, again, on this channel that we use books of antiquity and things like that. And then also, you know, we are witnesses, again, in this current time of things that are going on. And then we also have, you know, um, uh, like if we can look at these books of antiquity and link them with the Bible and then link them with things that are going on and we can see kind of what's coming and what's going on, you know, in the world today. I don't know. It's like, it's the coolest thing to me, so... Again, I hope you enjoy these types of uh, videos because, you know, this is what's going on. <laughs> and it's just like, okay. So anyways, I can't remember where we stopped. So we're going to just go back to page 222. <laughs> and um, it says, the, uh, thus the faith of even the devout exiles was beset by manifold trials. Trials under which in too many cases it gave way altogether to most of them deeply imbued as they were with the teachings of Deuteronomy, the loss of the temple and its worship was in itself crushing, uh, a crushing uh, privation. Um, and again, when it's talking about this temple, the loss of this temple, like, I don't know why, um, <laughs> you know, lately I've just been feeling like, you know, there's something going on. There's a shift. There's an alteration going on again in society. And I think that, you know, um, the truth is being oppressed, subdued. And I think that we just, you know, um, I mean, it's kind of concerning, but it's just like, you know, we have to, you know, still press forward, but at the same time, you know, it is what it is. So you have to, you know, I'm just saying like, is it just have to keep on keeping on, right? In hopes that people will catch on, you know? Um, and it's, it's pretty shifty because everybody is not the same. Everybody is not expected, you know what I'm saying, to be the same. And, you know, some people have certain callings, which again, <clears throat> I feel like if I have to like totally alter myself in order to perform in any type of, uh, job title or profession, uh, I don't know. It doesn't really work for me. Like I just want to be free. <laughs> you know, to do as I please. Again, it's, and we're not hurting anyone. So, you know, um, I mean, it, maybe somebody's feelings, you know, but again, that's probably it. And it says, um, yeah, so it seemed to them to be nothing less than the severance of the tie, um, which bound them to Jehovah. Okay. Now, again, we know that there's plural gods and again different gods but again i think the intent when people use these terms is to focus on one particular god or that way um i don't see it as you know um that's just how i see it um so it says in their uh despair some were inclined to welcome the visions of false prophets and to uh boy uh boy i don't know 
maybe that's the typo, uh, themselves up with the hope that by some means the chastisement would had descended on the nations um, would be reversed. Others gave vent to rebellious complaints of God's dealings with them. So again, <laughs> that just struck me and it was funny because again, like I think that that's what a, peop a lot of people get from this channel. But again, what I'm doing is like straddling the fence. Yes, where we're looking at the text in a non-biased way and we're trying to see what where the truth lies. And you know, it, it, it's like investigative reporting on the text to see what is real, uh, and what may be, you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, so it's kind of like an examination or whatever of all of these things wrapped up in one. But it's just so funny, like it's, it's very prophetic too. Because again, I feel like, you know, maybe everybody is not. And maybe people won't even be honest about it. And see, I just have to be honest about it. I just have to be honest about it. Like I'm just going to question things. And, and, and sometimes it does feel as though it's just like, hmm. You know, I'm sitting here and I'm I need this and I'm and, and I'm I've been doing this and and you know really all I'm looking for is this or I want the truth or answers or you know when I'm uh, communing right with Elohim um, and sometimes it feels like you know it, it that answers are not coming. I have to question myself like who is. You know what I'm saying? For and again, it might just be different for everybody. It might be different for people. But for me, it seems like a, a lot of times I have to go within, deep down, somewhere within me to find these particular answers. You know, I know. Uh, you know, and again, still giving glory to Elohim for being able to even realize and recognize. But at the same time, you know, I feel like just dealing with some of the energies that I deal with, especially when it comes to some of these um, uh, women or goddesses, that we hold the key as well uh, through wisdom and, you know, and uh, <laughs> intuition and we just have a certain connection, I think, that's different to nature and so yeah so again the way um of Je jehovah um they cried is unequal the sins of their forefathers were being uh expated by a uh, comparatively blameless generation others gained uh Others, again, crushed by the weight of national and personal calamities, sank into listless apathy and uh, dispensant, uh, <laughs> despondency. <laughs> um, our transgressions and our sins are upon us, and we pine away in them. How then shall we live? And this is talking about Ezekiel. I'm thinking that's uh, 33 and 10. And it says, but the exiles were not left destitute of religious teachings and consolation. A prophet of striking power, a strikingly powerful um, and resolute character was raised up by Jehovah to guide his people through this trying uh, epoch in their history. Uh, to preach uh, repentance and to encourage dropping or drooping faith. And again, I see a lot of men, um, young men and women um, out there doing this very thing, you know, at this time. Um, and it says, Ezekiel, the son of Busey, was by office and descent a priest who had been carried to Babylon with other captives in 1597 and had taken up his abode in Tel Abib. And I don't know why that sounded, you know what, matter of fact, I think this is the very word that was on the screen today when I looked up, because, you know, sometimes, um, Again, I'll have a, a television show running in the background. And um, I think it was something like Tel Aviv or something like that that came up on the screen on that show uh, Lucifer today. And I was going to, uh, I know of Tel Aviv or whatever, <laughs> but I was going to Google it and see what it was talking or pertaining to. But I don't know. It's just funny. 
It says, besides the river of Chebar, where a colony of Jews had settled, um, here he exercised a kind of spiritual uh, pastorate among his fellow countrymen and offered needful counsel in writing to all who cared to consult him. Uh, the substance of his exhortations in, uh, is contained in the first division um, of his book. It says, like Jeremiah, again, <laughs> Jeremiah is somebody to be hating on the feminine <laughs> energy in my eyes, even though it's one of my favorite books. He insists on the um, antecedent uh, necessity of Judah's chastisement and denounced, and I wonder why. Mm hmm I'm sorry, these glasses be making it look like my eyes like drooping. It probably do in real life, but again. <laughs> um, okay. So it said, um, yeah, uh, and denounces the false prophets who fed the captives with vain hopes or flattered uh, the remnant in Judea with the suggestion that the Chaldean yoke would shortly be broken. And again, I do feel like there's a sense of this. I mean, you can call it in groups of whatever nations, tribes, or whatever, however you want to. Um, again, I just say just very, be very careful and um, um, uh, use discernment when dealing with anybody in this time, in me, in every single person. Um, because I feel like this is the time of us being free or choosing to say that, okay, you know, we are, you know, and then also then ending up signing up for something else or another form of uh, servitude again <laughs> in many, many, many different ways. And again, some of us are going to have to take some uh, sorts of positions and things in the kingdom. Um, and hopefully, again, I, what I'm looking for and looking at is the fact that, you know, if it is something new and sources doing something new, you know, then we have to like take into consideration that this means that some things that even we thought were not good or uh, uh, dirty at one time that now source has put people through these trials of a form of judgment in a sense um, in order to kind of see who uh, would work best and what uh, what spaces and then, again I guess when people get in those positions or whatever um, you know I guess they have to be held accountable and we have to hold them accountable you know to make sure that again things are going the right way and I don't think it's going to have anything to do with skin color or anything even though again we have that to still look at because the you know particular things are going on right now but I think right now in the in this realm it's more about land resources trusts and deeds and you know documents and like people using stuff like that right now to gain and some people are doing it in a legit fashion and they're doing what they're supposed to be doing you know and then in other instances it might end up getting people trapped or you know um getting it people into things that you know they may not realize um, depending on who you're dealing with and who dealing with you and who got information and access to things that are pertaining to you. So, um, all right. So anyways, <laughs> all right. So, okay. So that the Chaldean yoke will be uh, shortly broken. Cause I feel like, again, we, we have been, uh, again, put under the eye of something else and not, at this point in time and I just can't really I don't know it just brings me back to the infrastructure and things like that so again he strives to awaken the faithful spirit of the true uh penitence wait penitence and the sense of personal accountability okay true for the misfortunes um that have uh befallen the nation but he also cheers them, <clears throat> excuse me, by promises of, t of a time when they shall be restored to their own land uh, with a, a conscious sense, uh, cleansed and a heart renewed by the spirit of Jehovah. When the covenant so often, uh, when the covenant so often broken in the past shall be faithfully observed. 
Ah, when Israel shall be Jehovah's people and he their God with these uh, addresses to or addresses to the nation as a whole, Ezekiel combines solemn appeals to individual souls. Let let them one and all cast away their transgressions, turn and live, seeing that Jehovah has no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, but will judge everyone according to his ways. So, uh, so again, I don't know. Something seems funny to me. It's just standing out to me because we're scrying, right? <laughs> and we're seeking and sharing. So again, to me, I don't know. It's, it sounds like something. It's just like, you know, why? Like, I mean, it's, I know people try to, you know, uh, explain a lot. And I still don't get it. Like, of why these people had to go through what they did. I kind of see now like with the actions or whatever, but it just seems a little bit harsh and it just seems like there's something deeper to it. And like I said, we're dealing with land, resources, deeds, heirs, royals. And so, at, you know, at that point in time, it makes me think, hmm, well, why did they have to wait until last? What, did, what was going on? You know, saying and, and seeing how, like I'm saying, <laughs> realizing that foreign, you know, energies at that time. And possibly now. I mean, it was going to keep it real on this channel, like all the time. So again, um, we're setting things into place and it's like, okay, you know, here, and now you guys can come in and this is set up here and that is there and this is how it is and da 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 da. But again, you left or um, like, a, uh, I can't remember what channel it was, but it was a soul sibling. And again, I'm really bad with remembering. Um, soul sibling was talking about not boasting against the original stock or the original root uh, groups. And, and you know, like I said, I feel like these are the original root groups, but there's also ones that are exalted. And then there are the ones that are in the lower caste or class. And again, I feel like the reason why it always happens this way is because the ones that are in exalted positions um, are the ones that, or have been grafted in, are the ones that are always gonna have to get the upper hand. They never want the upper hand to be in the hands of the pure bloodlines that's just what i feel <laughs> when it comes to anything that has to do with land money resources and things that's it all right those are usually the priestly ones the ones that were stuck holding the bible while everybody was everybody else was out gaming and gathering the goods and again when it comes to the women i feel like that's when idolatry women were being put in certain positions and the original women for whatever reason were and I feel like it has something to do with their personalities and them knowing who they were and what was theirs and <laughs> their right or whatnot and again I think that that is some of the thing as to what it was. All right? So again, I mean, we can see if things are going to be right this time or people will do right this time. And I think that, I don't know, it still leaves those particular people in a bad situation because everybody else has so much time with this head start. But again, we were doing our due diligence. And again, that was a part of it as well. But I guess now we know so that we can question these things in this day. All right. Let them one and all cast away their transgression. Okay, we already read that part. It says, apart from his pastoral work, however, Ezekiel exercised a powerful influence upon the thought and as the thought, yeah, thought and aspirations of his uh, contemporaries. He was a man of large and uh, comprehensive ideas. He understood the real nature of the opportunity afforded by Israel's enforced sojourn in Babylon. Yeah. Sojourn in Babylon. What the nation needed at this crisis was to realize and to guard its uh, distinctive character and vocation. 
According in the latter part of his book, Ezekiel devotes himself to the task of sketching an ideal community, hallowed by a uh, presence in its midst of Jehovah's sanctuary, um, its institutions based upon the principles of the theocracy, um, its social and religious life regulated in every detail by the fundamental ideas of holiness. Ezekiel's con conception was uh, destined to be more fully developed in the age of restora restoration. It seems certainly to have largely influenced the uh, compilers of the priestly code. All right, and I hope we didn't read all this already and I just had my paper on the wrong page. Uh, meanwhile, however, religion had to adapt itself to the circumstance of time. The loss of the temple service was supplied by uh, meetings on the banks of the rivers and the canals where common prayer, maybe by commoners, <laughs> uh, was offered and necessary acts of uh, ceremonial purification could be performed. In course of time, fixed forms of prayer uh, come in use and buildings were erected for worship, okay? Um, again, these buildings, I don't know, I feel like these have more to do with also, you know, yeah. Close to, I think, certain individuals and things like that. At a latter period, the public reading of the law became customary, and since the sacrificial system was necessarily in uh, abeyance, ab um, its place was taken by such rites as could easily be uh, practiced at a distance from Palestine. <laughs> Circumcision, fasting, and rigid observance of the Sabbath. These ordinances were devoutly cherished by the exiles and uh, henceforth uh, acquired peculiar importance as being distinctive marks of Jewish faith and nationality. And I think it's so funny that, you know, a lot of people that know this stuff inside and out act as though they don't believe in God or they act as though they don't study. You know what I'm saying? So I feel like it's very funny because, again, some of these people I know you have to be. I, Cause I see you, and it's just like, um, why? You know what I'm saying? Why act like you don't? You know what I'm saying? If you do, and then it's like it just shows you that like this stuff is deeply bred. But then again, it's it's the groups again that are not judged, the ones that can get away with. They're like the stainless, you know, steel groups that um, feel as they're if they are the ones that get to do the judging, and they don't get the to be judged. You know, they don't, it's not like all eyes on them. <laughs> and again, I'm pretty sure everybody's had their turn. It just happens in a different way. And some of us just have had to go through a lot more trials and tribulations uh, because of whatever reason, right? Usually it's because of uh, <laughs> stopping someone from gaining something that again, sometimes is already something that they're supposed to be doing. But, you know, again. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so it says the exile also gave birth to the consciousness of the unique value of Israel's uh, sacred writings. And again, in these days, it could be writings or speeches or views. Okay. Okay. Um, as we have already noticed, the foundation of the canon of scriptures was laid then in the book discovered in the temple in 1621 was, or it says 621, but I think it's 1621, okay, was officially uh, promulgated and accepted as the basis of a national reformation. Now, again, this is the short, the book called uh, Short History of the Hebrews, and I think it's from 1902, okay? Just in case I didn't mention it, okay? Then came the exile uh, when a period of enforced inactivity and religious reflection succeeded an era of disaster and tumult. The result was that the Jews learned to find a new interest in the history of their nation. Uh, look at this. This paper is in the wrong spot, y'all. 
<clears throat> this paper is in the wrong spot. I think I already read that part. Okay. Yeah, I think this part is already read. Mm-hmm. Let's see. Okay, so we did the part about the yolk or whatever. Um, okay, we already did this. Mm. Deuteronomic. The results, however, may be seen in a narrative portion of the Pente. Y'all know that word, I think. In the books of uh, Joshua, the, the so-called former prophets. Okay, and kings, the so-called former prophets. See, I don't know. The kings make me think about, like, the Nephilim, fallen angels, the watcher. You know what I'm saying? I don't know why. The circumstance under which they were uh, compiled explained the peculiar character. Okay, so yeah, revising, editing, refreshing. Um, the literary uh, monuments of the past. Okay, so again, this is kind of like what we're doing now, you know, um, of what some of these people are doing, trying to bring a witness to the fact that uh, you've been being lied to. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Pay attention. <laughs> like that, right? So of these historical books, um, maybe regarded um, as forming collective, a kind of uh, theodicy. Theo, yeah, dicey, a uh, systematic attempt to justify Jehovah's dealing with his people. The calamities of the nations are unformally regarded by this school of writers as being the due reward of its sins, especially in the uh, frequent lapse into idolatry. Uh, to them, it seemed that the religious policy of Jeroboam um, of Israel and in latter centuries, the um, that of Manasseh, of Judah had brought upon the nation a retribution, which the superficial reformation in the reign of Josiah had been unable to avert. The other chief school of the exilic writers was a sacerdotal. Okay, we remember that there was uh, that uh, we rem we must remember that where sacrifice was impossible and the occupation of the priesthood was virtually gone. Dang. Members of the priestly caste, however, found a new outlet for their energies in literary work. They devoted themselves to task of codifying the ancient laws of holiness and the compiling that elaborate uh, exposition um, of Israel's law and early history which is commonly called the priestly code. Okay. Again, I feel like we read this already. But again, it speaks more about the priestly code. Um, reminds me of some uh, uh, soul siblings or whatever um, that I see today. Like, I, I kind of like to see everybody. Like, when I'm reading this, like, every, again, not everybody, but the people that I have run into. And again, there's a reason for that. Nothing happens. Um you know, everything happens for a reason. Okay. It consisted, we are told, by scholars of a collection of laws set in historical framework furnished with a brief system of genealogy and chrono chronology, uh, which extends in unbroken uh, continuity mm -hmm. from beginning to end. Okay, so again, let's talk about more about that. Um, okay, sometime before Ezra visited uh, Jerusalem. Okay, okay, yeah. So it was completed sometime before Ezra visited Jerusalem. Okay, and it says in 458, but again, it's probably 1458. Mm -hmm. All right. So the years of exile passed warily on, uh, completely settled down to their life in Babylon, and there seemed to be a prospect of a change in their condition. Again, same thing we're going, I mean, it's just like, come on, y'all. This shit. I mean, come on. All right. Okay. See, it just be this kind of thing where I'm just like, 
Can we see? <laughs> like, what we gonna do different? Like, come on, man. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And this is like, you know, I got my eye on you. All of yous. You know, well, I guess it really doesn't matter. You know, and if a living God would, you know, I don't know. I'm just looking at this, just totally different. Y'all, sometimes my smile is like, not even like that kind of smile. It's just like, mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but by many, the hopes of a restoration to their own land were still eagerly cherished at last. However, in the year, again, it says 562, but I think it's 1562, Nebuchadnezzar died. It was his successor, evil Merodach, or um, Emil Murdoch who is said to have raised the head of Jehoiakim, the, cap the captive Jewish king. Mm. Or could it be a queen or a king? After a reign of less than two years, evil Merodach was murdered and was succeeded in on the throne by his brother-in-law, uh, Nerig. Lisser. But as yet, the Babylonian Empire showed no sign of dissolution. After his uh, premature death in 556, which is probably 1556, however, a conspiracy was formed against his youthful son. Or descendant, right? Means the same thing. Which resulted in and ascension of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, a man of simple habits or a woman. <laughs> and then vice versa, because I think that most of the time we're talking about, we're, they would rather use men's names here. But again, we know that again, when we're looking at this whole thing, um, people can come back or again, souls can revisit and I feel like they could be, again, maybe they were a male energy that then, maybe a, f a feminine energy now, maybe it's a feminine uh, female with a masculine energy, vice versa. All right. Who displayed the quality, so they displayed the qualities of a religious enthusiastic enthusiast um, and antiquarian rather than those of the resolute and Sadduc uh, Sadduceus ruler uh, declining wait okay a man of simple habit and peaceful temperament who displayed the qualities of religious okay we are already that part okay uh, declining to reside at Babylon he practically handed over to his son, Belshazzar, the task of government. Before long, his empire was threatened by a new race of conquerors. In the year 15, well, it says 549, but again, you can add the one or not. The famous warrior Cyrus, king of Ansha, uh, Anshan, Anshan, um, a district in the south of Elam who had raised himself to a position of supremacy in his native country, again, his native country, Elam, attacked and dethroned as stages of Medea, seized Ekbatana, and by the year 15, I mean, 546, found himself as king of Persia, master of an empire extending from the Caspian to Persian Gulf and from the border of Assyria to the Indus. Uh, the rise of this uh, form formidable power was obviously a menace to the older monarchies of Western Asia. And again, all of this in my eyes, again, um, is dealing with the Americas, low key.
and 547, which is probably 1547, Nibonidus was forced by the rapid expansion of the Medo-Persia kingdom to form a defense alliance with Egypt, Lydia, and Sparta. Spartanburg. Mm -hmm. And the Cairolinas. Yeah. The same year, however, uh, witnessed the capture of Sardis. The Sardis Stone, huh? The fall of Lydian King Croesus. You know what? I'm wondering. I'm listening. I'm feeling like something just told me to think about. The three presidents. You know, we did that video um, not too long ago talking about the Sardis Stone, uh, talking about the president of uh, Haiti or Haiti. And then I think there was three more mm, in places again. Unfortunately, were passed away in the past. Yeah, a couple of uh, years during this situation that occurred. I'm just wondering if his story is sometimes repeating itself, like, you know, in a spiritual kind of way. During the next seven years, uh, Babylon neglected the opportunity of strengthening its defenses. And when in 539, Cyrus turned his arms against the unwidely empire, its power collapsed with startling uh, suddenness. All right. And it says in 1538, owing it uh, is said to the treachery of Chaldean uh, priesthood, Gubaru, the lieutenant of Cyrus, obtained possession of the great city without striking a serious blow. The city could also be a city sun in my eyes. Cyrus himself entered Babylon about three months later in October. Uh, October 3rd, 538, which I think is 1538. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, whatever, was disposed and banished. His son, the regent Belshazzar, was put to death and Cyrus was welcomed with enthusiasm as master of Babylon. Within a short space of 12 years, the Persian warrior had subdued the whole Western Asia and thus the uh, hegemony over the East passed from the Semitic to the Indo-European race. The conquest of uh, Cyrus uh, were undoubtedly hailed with special fervor by the Jewish, Jewish community. The exiles had watched with intense eagerness the advance of one who seemed to be marked out by providence as the future deliverer of Jehovah's oppressed people. It was about that time when Cyrus became king of Media or Medea of Media. <laughs> uh, 1550 or 550, uh, that the captives in Babylon first heard the thrilling voice of the great unnamed prophet whose writings are included in the last 27 chapters of the book of Isaiah. We can imagine what the emotions they had held, the words of consolation which proclaimed the near approach of Israel's restoration. 
the renewal of its national life and the imminent, the imminent downfall of the idolatries. Wow, I hope that I'm alive <laughs> to see of Chaldea, the future glory of Israel, the worldwide expansion of the kingdom of God. Why does it look like that? I don't know, it looks like my glasses look funny. Okay. And Cyrus the prophet taught his oppressed people to see the shepherd of Jehovah who should perform all his pleasure, the anointed one before whom the strength of kings should melt away and the gates of iron and brass be broken into pieces. The Persian conqueror indeed rise to the level of these glowing anticipations from motives of policy, as it seems, he refrained from interfering with the idols of Babylon. he or she. On the contrary, he represented himself as the favored servant of uh, Marduk and the vindicator of his honor and prestige, which the religious policy of Nebuchadnezzar had impaired. I'm trying to get it right. Next, impelled by a natural desire to get rid of disaffected elements in the vast population now subject to him, rather than by any special inclination towards uh, monotheism, he issued an edict giving permission to the Jews not the Jewish, but to the Jews and to the exiles from other parts of Asia to, um, and again, this is also reminding me of Nagas for some reason. Even like an upper and lower kind of thing, you know? Because I'm, 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 I'm pretty sure there's some interesting things behind that uh, Hoover Dam. in that area, I just think that there is. There's interesting things all over this land. <clears throat> okay, to return to their own land, okay. Land, the land. Mm. By this wise measure, Cyrus removed a source of danger to his new empire and at the same time dispersed into its more remote and outlining re regions, uh, populations bound to his throne and person by ties of gratitude. He recognized that in view of a possible rapture with e Egypt, it was important to maintain a friendly and loyal commonwealth with the Egyptian border. Accordingly, permission was given to the Jews to return to Palestine. They were not only allowed to carry with them the sacred vessels, which had been taken from the temple, but were expressingly encouraged by the Edict of Cyrus to rebuild the ruined sanctuary at, sanctuary at uh, Jerusalem. The leader of the first band of exiles who availed them so to, um, of the king's decree was a descendant of uh, David named uh, Shishabazar. Shishabazar. Mm. Prince Nazi of uh, Judah or Yuda, otherwise known as Zerubbabel, the son of Shishalit. Teal. 
Shalitiel. Hmm. Anyway, I had wanted to read more of this and I had stopped at one point. Uh, this book is very uh, prophetic, actually. This is what it looked like in case y'all, you know, I just wanted to read some. I hadn't read anything really all day. There it is. Okay, I, I hadn't read it. It's old. Some, you know, I'd be getting books. They'd be all messed up like this, but it's, it's all right. It still reads. <laughs> um, I just had wanted to read something. I hadn't read anything all day, and I don't feel comfortable going to bed without doing something that has something to do with reading or looking into anything. And I promised that I was going to do that. So again, I kind of just uh, spiff myself up a little bit to get on here and do that. Um, again, I don't know, y'all. <clears throat> I feel like, oh. You know, I got this a while back. I mean, I don't know. I like, you know, I, I mean, I like it. I, I don't think I fully, like, understand. I think it might be a little bit, you know, uh, some parts of it is really deep. A little bit uh, for me. You know what I'm saying? This is what I... I'll probably need like a reading partner or, or buddy to go through this with, you know, um, but it's very interesting and it does kind of like enlighten or just, you know, um, open up my eyes to things on a deeper level every time. But y'all see them, them, them Indians, them folks on the side over there, what they look like. I mean, just, I could look at this, like, for a long time, the, the image alone. So, anyways. Yeah, I wanted to read that. I just wanted to finish reading that because I was reading that um, to you guys the other day. And then it just so happens that I have been sensing some of this stuff today. And then I wanted to go ahead and finish reading it because I do kind of start stuff and don't finish it. And that's probably going to happen a lot on this channel. Because it's really just, you know, throwing the seeds out there. You know what I'm saying? So, I ain't trying to teach nobody nothing really you know and I think that it's just best everybody you know always do their own research don't rely on nobody else's and you know things like that so again um I want to thank you guys for watching uh gratitude and grand evening excuse me I guess I'm gonna go to bed I kind of want to just do like a freestyle with just talking to you guys um I don't know I might think about it before I go to bed just just talking about some things that I found like kind of interesting, you know, and this is like in, in this situation, like I'm not like really at a point where I'm like afraid to discuss certain things, but is it certain things I just be like, oh my goodness, like when I gotta, <laughs> and and I just can't like hold it in when I have to talk about these things, like it's just kind of like off the wall, and so it's just like, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna get myself together and not, and I'll come back. See, <laughs> apologies. That was a yawn. Okay. So yeah, I don't know. It seems like I'm really tired, so I may not come back. But anyways, I don't forget to comment, rate, subscribe, and join us in the Facebook group again. American Aber. Mm, my ear is ringing. In the Facebook group. American Aborigines Unchained for more, um, you know, alternative information. I'll see you guys soon. Take care.